Hi, this is Gautam and welcome to Shankaray's Academy YouTube channel. Now we are uh, hardly one month away from prelims and uh, what we thought is we'll be having a series of discussions of previous year UPSC questions. So first for today's video we'll be starting with geography, then we'll proceed with other subjects as economics, polity and history. Now. I just want to make the objective of this session pretty clear. Now as you would expect, uh, the objective of the session is not to tell you about the technicalities uh, which is part of the subject or the multiple things which you need to know dot for geography. The objective is just to tell you the pattern and the daemon or behind the UPSC questions. The questions are not difficult but they have the prospect to be tricky. And uh, if you start to look at how previous year UPSC questions are mostly done in general, they follow a specific pattern and uh, by following certain level of reasoning and logic, you should be able to eliminate options and narrow down to questions. So that is what we will be mostly looking at for today. So we will have a series of discussion for 30 questions and you will see that at the end of the discussion, if you are able to apply logic and reasoning even without uh, you know a very deep knowledge of the subject you will be able to narrow down to your answer. So we shall start with question 1. So consider the following statements. The earth's magnetic field has traversed every few thousand few hundred thousand years. Now kindly note when you have a two statement or a three statement question or at times in terms of match the following you can have maybe four or five statements. In those type of situations it is better if you could start from statement 3 or statement 4. The reason being that when you start from the fourth or third statement, there is more possibility in which you can eliminate your options. So we will start from statement 3. Now when living organisms originated, they modified the earth's early atmosphere of the earth. Fine. You go to second statement. When the earth was created more than 4000 million years ago, there was 54% carbon dioxide. 54% oxygen and no carbon dioxide. Now this is a pattern which you can see with respect to most questions in UPSC. The use of words no, only, all which have a complete negation. Now it is pretty logical if you apply it like carbon dioxide even today's earth you know it is a very very important significant component. Even though the percentage of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is pretty incomparable to nitrogen or oxygen, the role it plays in terms of global warming is extraordinary even in the minuscule percentage. But if you look at the word which is given here it simply says that like before 4000 million years there was absolutely no carbon dioxide which you know that is logically not correct. So you take out statement 2 which means options B and D goes out of contention so easily. Both of them are eliminated. Now if you look at the remaining options, statement 1 automatically becomes correct. So all you need to focus on is statement 3. When living organisms originated, they modified the early atmosphere of the earth. Now everyone knows with a slight reading of the previous uh, or you say the foundation of the universe that by the evolution of these organisms when they came into the picture, cyanobacteria, they modify the earth's atmosphere because these are the first organisms to functionalize photosynthesis and after photosynthesis became a part of living organisms, carbon dioxide was taken in and oxygen was given out as part of the process. This changed the early atmosphere. Now if you look at the third statement, yes you might need to do a level of reading but again that is preliminary reading. Uh, so this question is pretty easier just because of this one word, no. So since third statement is correct, the answer is C. Now applying the same principle, we will go to the second question. What are the significances of a practical approach to sugarcane production known as sustainable sugarcane initiative. Now at the outset if you look at the four statements it is given here, you might tend to think that this is a time consuming question because four statements again starting with the principle statement 4 scope for intercropping is more than as compared to conventional method, statement 3 there is no application of chemical fertilizers, statement 2 drip irrigation can be practiced effectively, first statement seed cost is very low in this compared. Now kindly note to understand and answer this question, all you need to focus on is a word in statement 3. Now if you look at sustainable agriculture, the statement 3 says there is no application of chemical or inorganic fertilizers at this. If, 
if you look at your preliminary reading any any subject any book when it talks about sustainable agriculture there is always this difference with respect to organic farming in organic farming or organic agriculture there is absolutely no application of chemical or inorganic fertilizers but when it comes to sustainable practices it is not that chemical fertilizers are completely disallowed at all they can be used but their use is to be monitored properly so you clearly know that statement 3 is wrong because of this factor if statement 3 is wrong option D goes out option C goes out and option 1 goes out the answer is B it is that simple you not need not break your head thinking about drip irrigation or scope of intercropping or talking about seed costs all you need to focus on is that sustainable agriculture in sustainable agriculture you can use chemical fertilizers that's the only thing which matters so I I hope you're getting the pattern clear now moving to the next question comes the following statements again since we are dealing with the same pattern of questions you can clearly see it here there is no east flowing rivers in Kerala there are no west flowing rivers in Madhya Pradesh when you talk about river systems in India you pretty much know the level of rivers which we have it is innumerable and when you say that there is absolutely no east flowing rivers logically you know it is wrong and the same thing goes for your second statement too there are no west flowing rivers in Madhya Pradesh you have so many the major river being Tapi itself which flows through Madhya Pradesh so both statements are wrong because of this again complete negation statement the answer is Delhi moving to the next question with reference to the role of UN Habitat in United Nations program working towards a better urban future, which of the following statements are correct? Now, here we are moving to an international organization. Well, you might ask me, how is this related to geography? Well, you know, when you talk about urban habitat, it is part of the program because classification of subjects is highly subjective after all. Now, if you again, we use the same principle. UN Habitat contributes to the overall United Nations system to reduce poverty, promote access to safe drinking water and sanitation. Okay. You look at second statement. It's partners or either governments or authorities only. Now, this is a word which is frequently occurring in at least 10 to 15 questions if you take 100 questions in a question paper. So, all you need to focus on is that this only word is provided. You need to focus more. So, logical thinking again you're talking about a united nations organization and if in a united nations organization you know it is a global institution which will obviously have interlinking or cooperation with so many institutions which are in and around the world will it have cooperation with governments yes will it have cooperation with authorities yes of course you need executive bodies to function but when you use the word only you clearly know that it is kind of a restriction which the organization is placing on itself like if you want to provide uh, safe drinking water and sanitation environmentally sustainable solutions why would you restrict yourself in operating with only governments and authorities why don't you go further so if you just use that logic you know that both option A and option C goes out of contention because your second statement is wrong now for tussle between options B and D you know that statement one is automatically correct now third statement requires some amount of reading of course in which you get the background on how it exactly works so the answer is Bombay for this it does contribute to United Nations system to reduce poverty and promote access to safe drinking water so the key word here was only moving to question 5 in India the problem of soil erosion is associated with which of the following now let's look at the three statements now again we use the same principle starting from statement 3 tropical climate fine deforestation fine terrace cultivation in these type of questions people usually spend much time on this one third one because deforestation is pretty inherent it is not just in India any place where you have any problem of deforestation there is bound to be a problem on soil erosion which means if two is correct you have the tussle between options A B and Delhi which is give or take C is completely out of out of contention now in these type of questions you go for a positive negation now you look at terrace cultivation now terrace cultivation most people know like when you read the basics of agriculture like in any area where there is sloping pattern especially if the sloping is steeper you modify the structure making it easier for water to percolate so in terrace cultivation the objective is to minimize soil erosion you're not contributing to soil erosion so this is a positive approach if 
terrace cultivation is not contributing to soil erosion, then obviously options A, C and D goes out of contention. You need not worry about what is the inherent meaning behind tropical climate. Does it, do you mean that tropical climate leads to increasing rainfall and increasing rainfall leads to soil erosion? You need not even spend more time or speculating or overthinking on what exactly will be the option. Now thing is, terrace cultivation is not bound to create soil erosion. So if statement 1 goes out of contention, then the answer is B immediately. This is a method of positive negation which you can use where an increasing level of overthinking is simply not necessary at all. Where you might tend to think in some areas there could be more soil erosion, some areas there could be less soil erosion. It's that simple. Move to the next question. Consider the following regions. Which of the following mentioned above are biodiversity hotspots? Now, let's take eastern Himalayas. I think most people are familiar, it's directly from your NCRT that Eastern Himalayas is a very important biogeographic region and since there is more and more economic development which is stressed in this region, Eastern Himalayas is an important hotspot. So you're talking about options A, B and D. Now just look at this one, Eastern Mediterranean region. When you talk about Eastern Mediterranean region, you're talking about countries like Northern Africa and Southern Europe. So essentially you're talking about today's areas of civil war, you're talking about Libya, Egypt, you're also talking about the areas, the Balkan Peninsula, countries comprising Albania, Serbia and so and so. So you clearly know that Eastern Mediterranean region, both in terms of biodiversity, it is not such an important region. So if you take out statement 2, obviously the answer is A. You need, need, to, you need not even worry about whether Northwestern Australia has a, you know, brimming wildlife. So all the focus was on option 2 itself. If you got it right, then the answer is fine. Moving to the next question, consider the following pairs matching the famous place and region. Now again, when the statement number goes beyond 1, 2 and 3 in those type of instances. Now let's take, given the same thing, 5 and 4. All you need to do is just locate this famous religious place with the area where it is located. Let's take Nasik. When you read in reverse, you know that this town is located in the state of Maharashtra. At the same time, when you say Malwa region, you are talking about Madhya Pradesh. Nasik is in Maharashtra and Malwa is in Madhya Pradesh. The state itself varies which means 4 is wrong. If 4 is wrong, B goes out, D goes out and A goes out of contention. The answer is C, it is that simple. Now when you look at it, you might tend to think that Bodh Gaya, Bagal Khand, you, you know, you tend to overthink when you compare 1, 2 and 3. But all you need to find out is, is one position matching. Keep this thumb rule in mind, if there is more than 4 or 5 statements, always think about one particular event which you need to find out is correct or incorrect. If you can find that right, you will definitely be able to narrow down on your options. Then you can definitely get to your gambling position. Moving to the next one, consider the following statements. In India, the Himalayas is spread over five states only. Now, and everyone knows that the extent of Himalayas is extremely high. You're talking about starting from the states of Jammu and Kashmir and extending till Mizoram, which is talking about the northwestern Himalayas, then extending over states of Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, and Sikkim, Arunachal Pradesh, then ending in Mizoram, which is a very large extent. So you can simply take the numerical value. You need not even count the number 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 to get to this answer because the keyword was only. So you take out first statement, then immediately option A goes out, option D goes out. So statement 3 becomes automatically correct. You need, need not even spend time on statement 3 on evaluating where is Pulikat Lake located, is it exactly on the border between Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. That is not required at all. You get first statement that it is wrong, then you can you will definitely find that statement 3 is correct because it is there in both the options. All you need to do is spend your time on this option. Western Ghats are spread over 5 states only. Now this statement you need to spend some time because most people might think that when you talk about a mountain range it will you know pretty much end in a specific area so when you talk about Western Ghats it's found in Tamil Nadu it is found in Kerala it is part of Karnataka it is part of Goa then it is part of Maharashtra and also remnants are found in Gujarat so it is spread over six states and not five states hence the answer is C but you clearly saw that just by a normal application of logic you were able to narrow down to two options B and C so easily without much effort at all so that is how the questions are designed you get one or two right then you'll be able to narrow down the options
names. Now let's look at question number 9, place of pilgrimage and location. Now again, using the same principle, reading reverse, let's take Pushkar. Now, you know, if you had looked about different states in India, Pushkar is a very important place which is in Rajasthan and Mahadeo Hills is nowhere in western India. You find that the third statement is wrong, B goes out, D goes out and C goes out. A is definitely the answer. You need not worry about where exactly is Sri Salem or Omkarishwar. All what was required is finding the third statement is wrong. I know that the same principle is getting repeated across multiple formats. It might be with reference to match the following, it might be with reference to two statement questions or three statement questions or even climatically logical questions. So all you need to do is find the odd one out, you will be able to narrow down the answer. Now question 10, which of the following are possible consequences of heavy sand mining in riverbeds? Now this question like most people, this was part of 2018 prelims question and uh, you know all you need to do to crack this question was apply a semblance of logic. Let's, you know, talk about it. You're talking about heavy sand mining, so pollution of groundwater, yeah, pretty much true. So second statement will definitely stay. If second statement is right, sand mining will obviously contribute to pollution of groundwater, which means immediately you're narrowing down to options B and D. Pollution simply denotes the appearance or presence of any unwanted particle in that environment. And when you go for heavy sand mining, it is bound to cause pollution of groundwater. You can immediately count down to options B and D. You need not even worry about the lowering of the water table argument at all. All you need to concern yourself is the first statement, decreased salinity in the river. Now, you are talking about a riverbed. And when you talk about a riverbed, you're talking about fresh water. Simple logic. Now, if you're talking about a large amount of salt content variation when it comes to your riverbed, then we'll not be consuming fresh water, we'll not be consuming water from rivers at all. That is simply not going to happen. Right. Which means the salinity component in rivers is extremely less, which does not warrant point of discussion. So inherently. The concept of salinity is not associated with fresh water, but we are talking about seawater. And hence, first statement has logically no connection with reference to heavy sand mining at all. The answer is Bombay. You can pretty much narrow it down without any problem at all. Now, moving to the next question. With reference to agricultural soils, consider the following statements. A high content of organic matter in soil drastically reduces water holding capacity. Now, look closely over statement 2. Soil does not play any role in the sulphur cycle. You might not know what sulphur cycle is at all. You might not know how sulphur is getting regenerated, not regenerated, I'd say redistributed between different components of the biosphere, lithosphere and the atmosphere and hydrosphere. But look at the statement. Statement 2 says soil does not play any role. Now, soil is a component of lithosphere and you know that sulphur is an important element or component which is part of most of the living systems which means sulfur will become part of soil at the same time sulfur will be removed from soil so if the statement was plays minor role or plays major role there is some point of discussion may need to think that is it such an important component or not major component as such but the question is pretty simple it says does not play any role at all which means there is absolutely no role of soil you simply know it logically cannot stand statement 2 is wrong and a and d goes out of contention which means statement 3 is inherently correct we have used this technique many times so need not worry about statement 3 all you need to concern yourself is statement 1 a high content of organic matter in soil drastically reduces its water holding capacity. Now, when you talk about water holding, you're talking about how far the water molecules will be retained in the top portion of the soil and it's that their percolation reduces. That's what you're essentially talking about. Again, logic here, you're talking about a high content of organic matter, which we are talking about large amount of dead and decaying matter, which is mostly composed of plants and animals. And when you have large amount of those components in the top layer of the soil, it simply means it is not easier for H2O to percolate easily, which means water will mostly be found in the top portion of soil. Here, the answer is again Bombay. It doesn't 
reduce your water holding capacity but it actually increases your water holding capacity it is simply like you're placing large number of obstacles for water to percolate multiple layers of soil so here there is it's not that you need to learn soil science or need to do a deep research in agriculture to get this first statement right higher content of organic matter in soil drastically decreases water holding capacity it's simply that in top layer of soil if i'm at going to add more components i'm going to make the composition top layer more complex i'm adding more components will water move in easily or will water stay water will obviously stay because there are more obstacles that is the only logic you need to apply here to get the answer bombay it is not the other options are simply not worthy of discussion at all so again you clearly see that to crack this question it is not expertise in agriculture but simple logical reasoning moving to question 12 the annual temperature range in the interior of the continents is high as compared to coastal areas what are the reasons okay thermal difference is the first statement thermal difference between land and water now this i think is a most basic concept when you talk about climatology because only based on this most of the components are explained you talk about land breeze sea breeze and the variation in climate climate between land the interior of the continents and the coastal areas it is principally because your land and water behaves differently to temperature conditions so you know that first statement is inherently part of the reason look at statement 2 variation in altitude between continents and oceans now look at the question very carefully the question says you're talking about variation in coastal areas and variation in interior of the continent so you're talking about interior versus coast you look at second option it says variation in altitude between continents and oceans now the logic on which the statement relies on us when you talk about interior of continents you are essentially saying that all parts of the interior of the continent will be at a higher latitude higher altitude when compared to the ocean system that is the indication which the statement is trying to convey right but we definitely know that it is not that all the segments of the continent right from the coastal area to the center will definitely have a higher altitude when compared to the ocean basin there are large number of areas which are depressions when you talk about the continent itself so comparing interior with coastal is completely different when you talk about altitude even interior areas can be at a lower altitude when compared to the oceans which is very much possible that's why you have depressions and lakes so if you look at it logically second statement is making a wrong argument second statement is wrong the answer is a need not worry about you know does interior have strong winds do we have heavy rains in interior as compared to coastal areas even this can be deciphered logically because coasts are absolutely having more chances of receiving rainfall as you are closer to more source of water so even when you say that this statement is wrong you'll be able to narrow it down so just by saying that second statement is wrong you're narrowing it to option a moving to question number 13 this is a wonderful question this is technically a reading comprehension question this is not a geography question or a question of international organization if you read the question all you need to do is just spend time reading this question india's party to the ramsar convention and has declared many areas as ramsar sites which of the following statements best describes as to how we should maintain these sites in context of this convention now let's just say that you have a convention you're ta not talking about ramsar convention you're just having a convention to conserve biodiverse areas look at the statements and tell me which is logically or practically possible in doing look at statement 1 keep all the sites completely inaccessible to man so that they will not be exploited option b conserve all the sites through ecosystem approach and permit tourism and recreation only statement 3 conserve all the sites through ecosystem approach for a period for a period without any exploitation with specific criteria specific period for each site and allow sustainable use of them by only future generations and look at option d conserve all the sites through ecosystem approach and allow their simultaneous sustainable use now looking at the four options you definitely see that d is practically possible you can't keep a site which is completely inaccessible at all which is a harsh restriction at the same time you can say 
like you are saying in option B that you want to use the ecosystem approach but you know permit use of tourism and recreation only what about economic approaches like if you say a large lake is considered as a Ramsar site then why can't you do any possible economic activity again first and second statement falls because it is uh, too negative you look at statement C it is a very specific restriction they say that for a period with a specific criteria specific period for each site and access for future generations but when you compare all the four statements with option four itself conserve all the sites through ecosystem approach and allow their sustainable use this is the most logical conservation method which any convention will prescribe so this is technically a reading comprehension question you need not know what is Ramsar convention you need not know when it was confined you need not even understand why we have Ramsar convention in the first place all you need to understand is which is practically possible get the option D the only thing which this question will test you is your patient and is your patience and not your logic moving to question 14 now this is one of the interesting questions Indian Ocean Dipole with reference to Indian Ocean Dipole, sometimes mentioned in news when we were forecasting Indian monsoon, which of the following statements are correct? Now, if you ask me, this is a reading comprehension question again. Look at statement 2. An Indian Ocean Dipole phenomenon can influence an El Nino's impact on monsoon. If you have worked for UPSC, you will definitely know the Indian monsoon. You will definitely have studied about El Nino also. You will definitely would have studied what exactly is Indian Ocean Dipole. You will at least have a vague idea. See, if the question was about Indian Ocean Dipole can positively impact El Nino's impact in Indian monsoon or Indian Ocean Dipole can negatively impact El Nino's monsoon or there is no effect on Indian Ocean monsoon, these are specific statements. You can sim you're simply saying that there will be an increase in rainfall or decrease in rainfall or there will not be any impact in rainfall. But if you look at second statement, it says Indian Ocean Dipole. You are talking about an atmospheric phenomenon which happens in the Indian Ocean. Whether it can influence or not, it can be a positive influence, it can be a negative influence, that doesn't really matter. All you are saying is whether Indian monsoon will be affected by Indian Ocean Dipole. Of course it does. Any statement, any even the first you know, definition or any part which you read in any sort of textbook will tell you that IOD is closely related to how rainfall distribution is done in India. So even if you have absolutely no idea whether it's a positive influence, negative influence, that is not required. All you need to know is IOD will definitely influence the impact on Indian monsoon. And second statement is inherently correct. So that's why I told you it's an Aussie question. You look at statement one. The statement is Indian Ocean Dipole. IOD phenomenon is characterized by a difference in sea surface temperature of tropical western Indian Ocean, agreed, eastern Pacific Ocean, tropical region. Now, if you think about it logically, where your Indian Ocean is located and where your Pacific Ocean is located, you are trying to compare a difference in sea surface temperature between western Indian Ocean and eastern part of Pacific Ocean. You can pretty much understand how far they are located and you know in terms of monitoring whether it is possible for two different parameters in two different oceans to be compared to come with a logical number. So you are talking when it comes to Indian Ocean Dipole, you are simply comparing parameters with, between western and eastern Indian Ocean. Eastern Pacific is somewhere else, western Indian is somewhere else. First statement is wrong. So, if you know where it's, it is Indian Ocean, it can't be as far as Eastern Pacific. You just need to know the location, that's it. The answer with second statement being right is Bombay. So, now I think you're getting the grip that most questions which you see as logic, which you see as difficult, is actually logical. All you need to do is follow the news for question 15. With reference to River Tista, consider the following statements. Starting from statement 3, River Tista flows into Bay of Bengal on the border of India and Bangladesh. Now, if it is flowing along into Bay of Bengal, exactly at the border of India and Bangladesh, then we will not be having the problem of river water dispute, which is arising between the state of Bengal and West Bengal in itself. Statement 3 is inherently wrong. All you need to know is it flows from West Bengal to Bangladesh. That's the reason. So the answer is bomb. It is not exactly at the border. So just following the political news, you will be able to narrow it down. Need not break your head. Where exactly is River Rangi? Does it really originate in Sikkim? Is it a 
tributary of river Tista. Where exactly does Tista originate? Where is where does Brahmaputra originate? What is the glacier from which both are originating? These are facts which you might you know which you might require to learn for the exam. But for answering this question and getting the plus two marks, it is absolutely not required to know these facts at all. All you need to know is just follow up the news and just from the logic you can understand that it is not at the border. The river is entering from West Bengal to Bangladesh. That is why there is a river dispute. Hence, you can simply narrow down to option Bombay. It's that easier. Moving to question number 16. This is one of my favorite questions uh, we were asked in UPSC. This was asked in 2015. Uh, this has been discussed multiple times in class also, but we'll do it once more again. Which one of the following regions of India has a combination of mangrove forests evergreen forest and deciduous forest. Now, you know the characteristic of mangrove forest, you know the characteristic of evergreen forest and deciduous forest also. I have given you four regions, North Coastal Andhra Pradesh, Southwest Bengal, Southern Saurashtra, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. See, I am not telling you that you will not be able to find the answer if you apply the relationship between natural vegetation and rainfall. You will get the answer for sure. It might take maybe 15 seconds. Not more than that. It is pretty straightforward because you need to think about it. But there is even, you know, even if you have absolutely no understanding of the relationship between natural vegetation and rainfall, this is definitely a plus two. The logic is simple. See, you are talking about three forest types. I mean, forget this mangrove, evergreen, deciduous, the names are not required. You are talking about three different forest types, which means three different forest types, they will have three different climatic regions. That's all you need to remember. Look at the options here. North Coastal Andhra Pradesh, South West Bengal, Southern Saurashtra, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. I think you've already found the similarity between first three. Now you might tell, you know, first all the three options are coastal areas. The logic is not that. All these three options, if you see, are extremely specific extremely localized regions. Think about it. You are talking about three forest types, which means three different climatic conditions, but the options given is North Coastal Andhra. You are talking about a very specific region, Southwest Bengal, specific, Southern Saurashtra. Three different forest types in a very specific region is logically not possible at all. Look at Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Andaman and Nicobar Islands is not localized. It is spread over a large area across hundreds of kilometers and it moves across latitudes, which means with respect to each and every latitude, there will be variation in temperature, which means there will be variation in rainfall. If there is variation in climatic conditions, then obviously your diversity will increase. The answer is Delhi. There is no need to understand the relationship between rainfall and natural vegetation, like what is the rainfall in Andhra Pradesh, what is the rainfall in Bengal or Saurashtra to narrow down to this answer. All you need to understand is these three are specific locations and this is a spread over location. You got that, you got, you got your answer Delhi and that is your plus two marks. So see, UPSC frames questions as tricky and not difficult and this is a very good sample. Every year in the 100 questions you will definitely find 5 to 6 questions peppered across you know spread across different subjects. This 2015 it was in geography, you will find it in art and culture, polity and economics. All you need to understand is the logic, you will get the answer in spite of the fact that you may not know the actual relationship in subject terms. Moving to 17, which of the following will have coral reefs? Now, any preliminary reading on coral reefs will tell you that coral reefs will have will require a certain level of salinity to survive. They can't survive in fresh water because they require salts for generation of or secretion of calcium carbonate. This any preliminary reading will give. You take Sundarbans. Sundarbans is possibly an area where there is so much of fresh water which is moving in. You have the rivers of both Ganga and Brahmaputra draining their fresh water into Sundarbans, which means an area with so much fresh water cannot technically have coral reefs. So you need not worry that, okay, I did not have a list which says uh, these are the areas in which coral reefs are present. I haven't read the list, which means I should not be attending the question. No, that is not how you approach UPSC in general. You, within the provided possibility to try to encounter how to work things out. So you take out fourth statement, option B goes out of contention, option D goes out of contention. All you need to worry about is option C and option A. Look at option A and option C. 
3 is right, 1 is right inherently. They are there in both the options. All need to worry about is statement 2. So, Gulf of Kutch, Gujarat, of course, it is present. So, you got it, you will be able to eliminate the options. Moving to 18, again, this is a Okay, it's not exactly a reading comprehension question, but like once you read the options, you'll know which is a better one. Himalayan range is very rich in species. So, they've already given that it is very rich. Which one among those the most appropriate reason for this phenomenon? Now, let's look at options here. A, it has high rainfall that supports luxuriant vegetation growth. Option B, it is confluence of different geographical regions. Option C, exotic and invasive species have not been introduced in this region. So, you see that option C is a negative statement, first two are positive. Option D again is a negative statement, it has, it has less human interference. Now, if you look at the question carefully, the question does not say that Himalayan range is, you know, is facing threat or that. The statement simply says, Himalayan region is rich in species diversity. Simple logic. If you need more biodiversity, then if your biogeographical zones are different, then obviously your biodiversity will be very, very high. You take the first option, it's simply false. Rainfall is only one component. It is not that if you have large amount of water, plants will grow. Plants not need now just H2O, they need carbon dioxide which is very well present, but they also need optimum temperature in which they can grow. So it is not that rainfall is the most important factor which dictates it. But if you look at option B, option B is very clear, different biogeographical regions in which multiple ecosystems coexist and that simply talks about biodiversity. So you take the answer directly from the question itself, you need not break your head about less human interference or whether invasive species is present in Himalayas or not present in Himalayas. So, the answer is derived from the question itself. It's again a logical reasoning based question. Moving to 19, with reference to India, which of the following statements is not correct? Now, again reading from reverse, the mountain areas account for about 30 percentage of the surface area of the country. Okay, you need to make some sort of calculation here. Alluvial soil is a predominant type of soil in the northern plains of the country. No problem, you definitely know it is correct. The dominant source of irrigation in the country is wells. Look at option A. About one third of the area of the country records more than 750 millimeters of annual rainfall. Now, if you look at option D, this is pretty reasonable when compared to option A. Mountainous areas account for one third of the country. Same thing, one third here. Because most of the terrain, if you look at India, you take the northern northern section of India, the entire northern section comprising of northern, northwestern Himalayas, you take Sikkim and in northeastern India, there is a large amount of area which is simply hilly region. At the same time, if you look at your peninsula plateau, you have both your western guards and eastern guards. And the peninsula plateau gets separated from the northern plains again through your mountains of the central highlands, which is again a mountainous region. So, when it says that one third, it is pretty okay that it is uh, part of your mountainous area. But if you look at option A and option B, you clearly know that th this is so much of an area when you talk about rainfall distribution, because a significant portion of India suffers from drought. And even if you look at areas of high rainfall, it is specifically distributed only across few, few parts of northeastern India. At the same time, parts of East Western Ghats, that is only the western section. When you move interior towards India, you know that the rainfall is extremely less. To say that, you know, more than one third of the country records, you know, more than 70, 75 centimeters rainfall, that is a pretty, pretty bold and outlandish statement compared to the rest of the three. Hence, the answer is A. So, of the all the 18 questions which we discussed about, 19 question will definitely take your time. But if you look at it carefully, all you are doing is just comparing option A and option D. This is also one of the ways in which you can narrow down to your question, especially for not correct statements if they are more overtly technical. So, within the options, you can compare one with the other and take your answer. Moving to question 20. Now, this question is actually easier if you look at the ground level. But kindly note, keep this thumb rule in mind. This type of question is usually asked in geography and at times you can have it in environment also. These type of questions are time trap questions. They just take time. You'll definitely get the answer, but it'll take time because Kotaim is in Kerala and Kohima are talking about Nagaland, which means you know the states where exactly it is located. The question is about what is the minimum number of states within India through which you can travel, including the origin and destination. 
so you know where is nagaland you know where is kerala so you will be able to find a route through which you can get to the one states remember this any question any question if you are doing this principle of counting how things work we saw on question previously regarding how many states does western guards pass through that was relatively an easy question because you know where western guards are exactly located so there is no problem in narrowing that to the question but here you need to find an alternate route you will definitely get the answer for the question if you start counting the only problem is it will consume time kindly note when you find these type of questions you can mark this question please do this question in either round 2 or round 3 please don't take it in round 1 because this these tend to consume at least 90 seconds of your time they need to process information you know find out these places and think where exactly they are then proceed do what in this question it might look tough but it is very easy just make sure you take it in round 2 or round 3 now we know that assam is a state so just for solving this question assam shares boundary pr with pretty much every state in your every state in your northeast in india so closest to kerala is tamil nadu so you talk about the eastern coastal states so after tamil nadu you have andhra pradesh and after andhra pradesh you have odisha and after odisha you have west bengal and that is a connection so you have totally 1 2 3 4 5 6, 6 and 7 states which form part of the chain and b is your answer so you know that by traveling through the shortest route you will get it but you know under exam pressure to make this you know recollection of all the states which is located in this area it will slightly consume more time so that is why i told you just take it as a round 2 or round 3 question but you'll definitely get this answer need not do it as round 1 Moving to question number twenty-one. Now this is an interesting question. Particular state in India has the following characteristics. It is located on the same latitude. This is the major hint, which passes through northern Rajasthan. Now, you look at the four options. Immediately, when you talk about northern Rajasthan section and compare the latitude, so you talk about Arunachal Pradesh, okay, Assam, Himachal Pradesh, and Uttarakhand. Now, even if you look at these four regions, you know the, how this how the distribution of the state is states are actually formed. When you talk about Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand, you're talking about this region essentially, and the question is focusing on the latitude comparing northern Rajasthan. So when you compare with the options, these two are not very close. Now look at option one. First statement: It is 80 percent of its area under forest cover. Now, if the state has less rates of urbanization. if the state has less number of renowned towns then you definitely know that the state will have a large amount of forest area you need not worry about okay do i know whether it's 85% 86% i don't know the forest area in assam i don't know the forest area in himachal pradesh that discussion is not required if the if the state which is under discussion if it is going to have a less number of towns it simply means that a large area is mostly rural or it is predominantly forest so you know that assam is not going to be a part of it most of assam is a plain and it's also an important contributor to agriculture b goes out of contention and from the first part itself that talk about parallel to northern rajasthan same latitude you pretty much know that himachal pradesh and uttarakhand is not going to work out so the answer is immediately arunachal pradesh where you can just by reading first statement you can get it because second statement if you look at it this is not the statement which gives you the clue over 12% of the forest cover constituted protected area or network in the state think about it logically it is not possible for anyone to memorize national parks and wildlife sanctuaries at the same time even if you know or i have a vague idea about the distribution of national parks and wildlife sanctuaries you will definitely be not in a position to say that it will be over 12% or less than 12% the take away which i want you to have from this question is that at times the clue or the logic for deriving the answer may not be in the statement which is given but it will be present in the question please make sure that if you look at two statement questions the clue will be here on the top and not on the statement that is why we had this point of discussion because this is an older question but even then we had to take this as part of discussion because this is an interesting type which upsc has framed and this 12% 80% is simply not necessary at all not the percentage the clue is here once you got the first statement right then these two pretty much vanish all you need to concern about is statement 1 you will narrow down the answer to arunachal pradesh moving to question 22 consider the following statements now this is interesting 
Rajasthan has iron ore mines. This is the only thing you need to consider. Now, mostly people think that Rajasthan is part is a desert area and hence when you talk about mining there is not much possibility of metallic mineral mining here. Just remember this when you talk about the structure of the Indian subcontinent you have the Himalayan ranges followed by the northern plains then you have the peninsula plateau. So if you take the states of the northern plains you're talking so for example if this is Jammu and Kashmir if this is Himachal Pradesh then maybe this state is uh, Uttar Pradesh or Bihar and uh, this state could be Madhya Pradesh or uh, Gujarat or uh, Zarkhand it could be any of the states you're talking about peninsula plateau the states which are in the northern plains do not have metallic mining at all the logic is simple if you want to go for metallic mineral mining then you need to hit the peninsula plateau the plateau region will need to be hit. You need to hit the crust. In Zarkhan, it is there. In Chhattisgarh, you are directly hitting the peninsula plateau. You take the structure of the continent here. The peninsula plateau is subsided. And over that, you have large amount of alluvial deposition. That is why you have the Great Plains. So, this is the reasoning behind it. So, no metallic mineral mining in UP, in Bihar, in Punjab, in Haryana, in Assam. That's why no metallic mineral is there. But if you take Rajasthan, you pretty much know about Aravalli Mountains, you are talking about a part of Peninsula Plateau. That's where most people do not make this correlation at all. Rajasthan, even though you have sections of the plain, it is primarily related to your Peninsula Plateau. And Peninsula Plateau is basically continental crust. And definitely you will have metallic mines in this location. There is no need to, you know, know the exact place where iron mining is done in Rajasthan. That is not required at all. All you need to have is an idea that this is not part of the Great Plains. Once you know the third statement is right, you know that D and C is right. There is no need to worry about second statement at all. Need not even worry that whether Andhra Pradesh and Zarkand has gold mines or do not have gold mines. Because iron is far more evenly distributed when compared to gold because gold is very specific and since iron is distributed you need to worry about statement 3 and not statement 2 or the exact location of gold mines is not required once you got statement 3 right then c and d is the only thing which you need to consider yourself so for statement 1 yeah for this you need to know some sort of polity so for the answer is c for that so in this question just the understanding of geography let you know this you need not know the exact location or the exact place where mining is done just a vague idea three more questions which of the following are advantage or advantages of practicing drip irrigation now for answering this question all you need to understand is what is drip irrigation now usually when you go for irrigation the entire field is flooded with water when you talk about drip irrigation the you have a specific irrigation channel which feeds water to the roots of the plants directly that is the only understanding you need to have look at the options and you will be able to narrow down logically reduction in soil erosion yeah of course because if you have a flood type of irrigation then the top soil of soil is eroded but when you go for a mechanized form of you know supplying water to the root of the soil then water is present only here which means soil erosion is prevented statement 3 is right which means b and c is definitely right need not even worry about soil salinity in large numbers. Look at option 1. Reduction in weed? Yeah, more possibility. Because if you go for flood irrigation, you are supplying water to unwanted areas also to the entire field. But when you talk about drip irrigation, you are applying water specifically to the roots of plants, which means weed you know, generation will be low because water is not getting diverted, which means 1 is also correct. The answer is C. It is that simple. So, need not be an expert in agriculture here also. Moving to question 24. What are the possible limitations of India in mitigating the global warming at present and in the immediate future? Now, rarely you do find questions like that and statements are given like a joke. Look at the question carefully. You are talking about limitations of India in mitigating global warming. Let's start from statement 3. Many developed countries have already set up their polluting industries in India. Now, this is a fact. This does not mean that India will be able to limit. Even if developed countries come and set their industries, we can still curb them. It does not 
put a limitation on our own expertise of mitigating global warming in India. So third statement is practically given like a joke. So third statement is wrong. Option C and D goes out of contention. Option 2 becomes immediately correct. Concern yourself with statement 1. Appropriate alternate technologies are not sufficiently available. It is true even today. Like cost effective technologies for mitigating global warming is still not available. So the answer is A. So again it is primarily a reasoning question not a geography question. Moon to 25, again reasoning. Southeast Asia has captivated the attention of global community over space and time. So, they are not talking about a specific war period like Cold War period or let's just say a Second World War or something like that as a geostrategical if any significant region. Which among the following is the most convincing explanation for the global perspective? Again, look at the question. They have already given that it is not concerned with space and time. And look at the options. It clearly says Second World War. Which means this is not the answer. Look at options B and C. B and C has a similarity. It says located between Asian powers of China and India. It was the arena of superpowers of China and India. So both of them pretty much convey the same meaning. It's not that since they are located between India and China, there has been so many times in history that it was the arena of, you know, interaction of superpowers China and India. So if you look at the terms China and India again it is vaguely subjective because when you talk about China you're talking about empires which dotted China and when you talk about India you're not talking about the present day India but you're talking about multiple empires which held sway over India and when you talk about Indian empires you know that only for specific period of time that an empire had control over large swathes of India and it was mostly disintegrated. So just by reading options B, the same point is getting repeated. Look at option D. It's location between Pacific and Indian Oceans, fine. And it's preeminent maritime character. Yeah, that is the reason because Southeast Asia is primarily a region of connectivity and archipelagos, which means it will become important geostrategic locations over a period of time. And Delhi is the answer. Again, reading comprehension with logic. Moving to question 26. This is an interesting one. As per UN Habitat's global report on human settlements 209, it is true even for today. Which one of the following regions has shown the fastest growth rate of urbanization in the last three decades? Now, think about it. Okay, You're talking about growth rate. You're not talking about the present rate of urbanization. So, any region or any area, if it is mostly rural or mostly developing, then that region will move towards an urban settlement pattern. That is obviously will happen because you are talking about growth, you are not talking about percentage. Look at it. Europe and North America. You definitely know that Europe is already having, it's a developed nation with large amount of urban population. North America and Europe got urbanized in, as in, in early section of 20th century itself. So both of them cannot have growth rates because they've already reached their saturation. So it's pretty much like this. They are here. You're talking about this region here of growth rate. You look at options C and A again, Latin America and Caribbean and Asia. And if you look at the largest share of developing countries it is mostly in area and if you look at population also it is mostly asia so you clearly know that the answer is a need not worry that you have not read this report global report on human settlements to narrow down to the answer that is not required at all all you need to understand is growth rate which means it should be mostly rural so it can't be an already urbanized area between these two which is the best op possible option go for asia because most latin american countries got independent just in 19th century itself and uh, if you look at asia most countries in asia got you know independence only after 1950s so they are trying to move towards an urban uh, settlement pattern and not Latin American and Caribbean countries. So it is again not based on the report. So any question you feel that it's based on report discussion or something like that, it is not required that you take the, you need to know the report to get to the answer. Just from the keyword you can get your answer. Moving to the next question, other than India and China, which of the following countries border Myanmar? Now, again the principle of negation. I've chosen a map question since uh, last two to three years there has been last discussion on map. Now we clearly know that Bangladesh is closer to Myanmar. 
like because we have this discussion of northeastern india and mizoram separates bangladesh and myanmar and they have their own border which these these two countries share border so you need not worry about option b and c because bangladesh should be there in the options so thailand goes you need not have this discussion on thailand at all you need to discuss regarding laos and vietnam if you look at the structure of southeast asia you know that vietnam is the farthest uh, southeast asian country which is located as as the entire area of vietnam if you look it is uh, located uh, you know across latitudes along the southeast east area so this is the structure of vietnam and this is far away from myanmar so negating vietnam you can go for option d but what i'm trying to convey is uh, even without knowing the discussion about thailand you can narrow down between options a and d and between laos and vietnam if you know that vietnam is located on the eastern side of indochina peninsula you can get the answer as d because vietnam is far away and hence it has to be laos moving to question 28 comes the following statements the barren island volcano is an active loca active volcano in the indian territory sounds fine this is one of the important statements given in ncert so if you know the first statement itself you know that the answer will have to be between a and d need not worry about options b and c at all this is not required and this is the first statement which is given in your ncert like this is the most preliminary discussion okay let's say you do not know the first statement not very sure sure about it let's take this one barren island lies about 140 kilometers east of great nicobar even if you don't know you clearly know that this statement is wrong because andaman and nicobar highlands will have this type of a structure in which they are spread over north to south you need not worry about 140 kilometers if the islands are located in an east west direction then you can worry about distance of 140 kilometers or 150 kilometers it's a very simple north south discussion which means it is simply not possible now between options a and d for the last year if you had followed current affairs then you can get this statement three easily last time baron alkino erupted was in 1991 and has remained inactive since then now this was a news actually in the month of january baron volcano had an eruption and only based on that this question was framed so the answer is delhi for this so just by having the preliminary understanding two options can be easily eliminated moon 29 simple question if you travel through himalayas you're likely to see which of the following plants naturally growing there the discussion should only be on this one sandalwood sandalwood is a species which is found in peninsula plateau it is absolutely no reason to associate itself with himalayas you take out statement 3 answer is a need not worry about different species of oak or different species of rhododendron that is not part of discussion at all just to understand the distribution of sandalwood where the species is located you will be able to narrow down the options moving to the last one south atlantic and south eastern pacific regions in tropical latitudes cyclone does not originate what is the reason now we'll spend some this is the last question we'll spend some discussion here see when you talk about these type of reasoning questions this is either asked in climate or your oceans at times you have this in part of environment also remember this whenever you talk about a specific cause effect questions you need to focus on the cause why there is less possibility of cyclones or which are the following factors which cause it if you look at the four options usually three options are given which will simply be statements or facts in that area i'll give an example let's take this one coriolis force is too weak now if you look at this particular statement this is a statement it is not a cause or a reason which can influence the formation of cyclones okay you take this one absence of land in those regions yeah if you take southern hemisphere compared to your northern hemisphere southern hemisphere has very low percentage of land it is mostly composed of water so you take the south atlantic region you take the southeastern pacific you don't find a large amount of land mass again this is a fact you take the first one sea surface temperatures are low yes it is low again it is a fact but the question is on reason what people tend to do is since they try to find these uh, facts as true they make the connection that since these facts are true then these facts should contribute that to that specific effect 
that is not the usual way things work out. Remember this, this is the usual pattern how things are framed when it comes to reasoning questions. Need not focus on facts, look at the reason. This is the reason why you have less number of cyclones. Intertropical convergence zone rarely occurs in this specific region. So, to wrap it up, I'll just explain what exactly it is. So, if you look at the structure of a tropical cyclone, you're talking about an increasingly low pressure area and that intensifies your tropical cyclone. Your ITCZ is nothing but a low pressure area, your equatorial low pressure belt as such. Now, if you take the distribution of land in Earth, you take your northern hemisphere, northern hemisphere has more land which means land has the capacity to trap more heat so if it is more hotter mostly your ITCZ is found in the northern hemisphere and hence even during a winter season the ITCZ does not shift too much into the southern hemisphere beyond a specific point of time so if you don't have a low pressure region which is getting created in southern hemisphere, then your cyclones will not occur because this is con contributing strongly to the formation of cyclones. And that is a discussion B. Now, even though this is, I think of all the questions, this is the most technical which you have dealt today. The objective is this, why we talked about this. Remember, facts are not reasons. When you talk about reasoning questions, think about the principle of cause and effect you will be able to get the answer is Bombay. So that is the end of discussion for geography. I believe uh, the uh, objective of the session was clarified because it is not about technicalities but just to tell you that uh, in spite of the fact that in some areas you may not know the exact uh, answer and in some areas you may not even know the report just by using your logic and reasoning you will be able to trap enough number of questions to get you through to prelims and all the very best we will be following up with sessions on other subjects also shortly thank you